Hello again, everyone. I'm Dick Stockton, and welcome to Stockton. In this episode, we're talking to one of the top 50 greatest NBA players. Now, this is a guy who was an NCAA champion and named a Final Four Outstanding Player. He was NBA Rookie of the Year, an 11-time All-Star, two-time Olympic gold medalist, a member of the Basketball Hall of Fame, and had his number... 33, retired by the New York Knicks. Of course, I'm speaking about none other than the great Patrick Ewing, now Coach Ewing, at his alma mater, Georgetown. And we're going to talk to Patrick in a moment. But first, I want to remind you that I always wrap up the shows with Taking Stock, where I'll give you my opinion on something that I think is worthy of a closer look. So make sure you stay tuned after we speak with Patrick. But now a guy that I've seen play many of times... And I've known him. In fact, uh, I was uh, honored to broadcast one of his great games as a rookie on Christmas Day when the Celtics and Knicks hooked up at Madison Square Garden. I'm sure we'll talk about that. It's a great pleasure to welcome Coach Patrick Ewing to the podcast. My first memory of you is Christmas Day when you were a rookie, the Celtics and the Knicks. Do you remember that? Oh, definitely. I remember that game as if it was yesterday. Uh, One of The best comebacks in Nick history, in my opinion. (laughs) What do you remember of it, Pat? I just remember we were down, I think, about 20. We're down about 20 points in the first half. We uh, mounted a a great comeback in the second half and was able to to come away with the victory. I think I had like 30-something points and, you know, like maybe 15 rebounds, a few block shots. It was just a great game. It was a great uh, team effort uh, to come back and uh, secure that win. It was so great, I remember, for the the Knicks crowd because when you were drafted by the Knicks, they said, boy, we've got a chance now to reemerge as as a a power in the league. And uh, and that crowd was going crazy. And Christmas Day was normally our first telecast of the year. And to start with a win over the Celtics in that kind of a comeback fashion – you know, put the stamp, I think, on, on Patrick Ewing being a tr- an attraction in the league without question. Yeah, it was, you know, like I said, it was great. You know, me going against the, the Celtics. Uh, I grew up in Boston, spent a lot of times at the Garden watching the Celtics play. And to, to have a great game uh, so my family and friends could watch it back home, it was remarkable. You are one of the most patient people that I have seen, even from afar, because I haven't talked to you in a couple of years. You have paid your dues. You were a great player. Um, you've been an assistant coach, you know, with the Wizards, the Rockets, the Magic, associate head coach with the Hornets. And now you, you finally get a chance. And uh, I know, you, you know, you've been saying, well, when am I going to get my NBA chance? But I think <laughs> this thing is something special, Patrick, right? It's very special. Very special. Naturally, you know, when you do something, you want to try to see if you can do it at the highest level, and, you know, I think that I'm, I've been blessed to be able to come back here to Georgetown to to coach at my alma mater to uh, continue the dream and the reins that Coach Thompson has built, the legacy that he's built. Uh, you know, it's our goal to try to get this program back up to the level that it was uh, when we were the, the alpha dog, we were the, the hunted. But it's, it's great, you know, uh, you know, to be back here. This was the only college job that I think I would have taken. You know, being back in D.C., the nation's capital, one of the most powerful uh, cities in the nation, and uh, to coach the Hoyas, it's, uh, it's, I think it's a dream come true. It should be, and it is for those people who uh, remember John Thompson's Georgetown Hoyas and the heights that they reached. 32 years now since you left Georgetown. Take me to the steps of how it happened where you were contacted for this. Tell me what happened. Well, um, what happened is, you know, unfortunately when they fired JT3, you know, I was definitely uh, disappointed when I saw that happen. I thought that he had done an outstanding job. He just had two down years. And, you know, in this industry, if you don't win, the writing is always on the wall. Uh, He got let go, and, you know, my son who was on the staff, I was very disappointed for both of them. And then, you know, Coach Thompson called me, and, you know, he told me, I think you should uh, try to get this job. It's a it's a great job, and you know you could you could do wonders there. You never know if you're going to get an NBA job, so if you can get this one, you should take it. I told him I had to sleep on it, uh, slept on it, thought about it, and you know, woke up the next morning and told him that he was right. And I reached out to the president, and 
told him that I was very much interested in the job and I went through the interview process and here I am today, uh, you know, the the head coach of Georgetown University. It takes a lot, Patrick, uh, for, uh, you know, your former coach to see his son relieved of his duties. Uh, normally you'd say, well, you know, he needed more years, more, you know, what, what has been his attitude as he talked to you about having his son lose the job if, just for that? Well, naturally, he's a, you know, like any parent, you'd be, you're disappointed. You're disappointed that, you know, your blood is, is let go, uh, especially in the fashion that, that it was done. You know, but I think both he and JT3 sees me as an extension of, of, the, of their family. Even though I'm not blood, I'm still a big part of the legacy. You know, uh, Coach Thompson has done an outstanding job. I can still remember the day when he came to my home in Massachusetts, to Cambridge, Massachusetts, to talk to me and my, my mother and father about uh, attending Georgetown University and me sitting there, you know, mouth wide open, you know, just the way that he spoke, um, you know, very eloquent. Uh, and, you know, he was somebody that I thought that I could emulate uh, when I grew up. And, you know, here I am uh, taking over the reins uh, to the place and the university that he helped to build. How did John get you to Georgetown? What did he say? Uh, you know, I think the main thing is how, how he spoke. The fact that he played the position, you know, was an educated man. I just thought that when you listen to it, how articulate he was uh, or is, that's somebody that you could emulate. You know, not to say that, you know, my father was there and, you know, my father was a great man. I love him to death. Uh, but I, I felt like I had two fathers. You know, my dad, who my, is my biological dad, who was always there for me. And also uh, Coach Thompson, who, you know, if anything goes wrong, I can always uh, call and, and get advice from. Tell me what Georgetown represented. What, you know, we know it's really one of the finest academic schools. Uh, I always looked upon Georgetown as a regal, higher, you know, high level. It's high level. Uh, you know what, when you say Georgetown, you know, people understand what you're talking about. Uh, <laughs> when you were there, tell me what that represented to you. Georgetown was one of the, the best four years of my life. I came into college a boy, which is what all uh, all freshmen do. You come in there thinking that you're you're already a man or you're already a woman, uh, but you know you get here and you grow and you learn and you meet meet people from all different walks of life and you bond. And you know I just thought that the whole experience here in Washington D.C. It helped me to to become and shape my my life as an adult, and I just thought that everything here was was so remarkable that, you know, when it was time for my kids to come to school here, my my son graduated from here, and my daughter, who she's now a senior, getting ready to graduate from here. That 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 experience was so remarkable and so great that I thought it was a great place for them to to come and to develop. When you were at Georgetown. And I covered, uh, you know, when I was with CBS, we covered a lot of your games. There was a certain mystery, okay? The, you know, they have that phrase, Hoya Paranoia, which I never Hoya really paranoia, understood what baby. that meant. Yeah, but <laughs> it, I got to tell you something. And you tell me whether this is – now, I worked with John, your coach, many years right. when we were at Turner doing NBA games. And this is what he told me once, and I was, like, shocked. I said, John, and we got to be close. Tell me – Tell me about that, he says, Dick. You know, remember there was a door and you didn't know what was behind the door? And it was the mystery <laughs> of what Georgetown was? There was nothing behind the door. <laughs> he says it was all created by out the outside. And, and all of the mystery and all of the intrigue and all of the, you know, the strange a aspects right. of, you know, where you guys were staying and where you were practicing and all of that and the way the practices were held in the interviews in the media. Is, is that right? Was it was it a kind of a that situation you where know the, you know how the media is and they all oh, everybody wants to have a story. So naturally, uh, that was a big story to them. We try to to keep our business in house and everybody wants to you know to broadcast their business so naturally because we were very guarded with with our the things that that were going on in, in our practices or in our in our lives you know they it, it made it such a big story and then we were such a dominant team that also add fuel to the fire you know i, I just think that like you said you know it is what it is or was what it was but um 
we just went about our business the best way we can, and then the media just added fuel to the fire by you know saying that we are you know we're paranoid or we can't get along with other people or you know whatever the, whatever the heck else that, that they were printing back <laughs> then. But you know it, it it wasn't the case. We were just focused and bent on trying to be the best uh, college team that we could possibly be, uh, going about our business our way without any any regret. I mean, there was a fear. I mean, you know, there was a fear of Georgetown. And maybe that was a good thing for you guys. Oh, we loved it. Now, we know, uh, I know at one point they uh, compared us to the Raiders. I mean, I thought that was that was something great. The Raiders were one of the, especially back then, was one of the dominant teams in, in, in football's history. Uh, so to be compared to that team, was uh, we thought it was, was a great thing. So now you come to Georgetown and uh... – your stamp of what basketball is all about, and you have seen, because you know, I know you watch college basketball and you watch the, you know, young guys coming up and you look at the coaches around uh, the NCAA over the years, including the tournament, uh, the fundamentals. I, I look at basketball and the college basketball scene and the panorama, and I see defense, rebounding, fundamentals, a little bit going by the wayside. You think that's true? Well, I'm not going to say it's gone by the wayside, but it's hard when you have so many one and dones that when I played, we were here four years, three maybe, you know, then the max four. So a lot of the fundamentals was being taught. You know, when you have a, a guy or a kid or, you know, come into the, college, into the college and just say one year, how many fundamentals can you teach him in that one year? You know, so I think that it was one of the reasons why the fundamental is not as good at his at it as like it was when I played but you know I, I think you know, you know when you look at the kids there you have some great talent some talented kids coming in and coming out uh but it's hard to develop them in college the way that we were, they were able to develop them when when I was there because we were we were here much longer so that's why you have a lot of de- uh developmental coaches in the NBA that's trying to to bring them up to to speed and uh but only now is the difference is they're in the, they're doing it in the NBA other than rather than in college where like it was when I was coming up. How do you feel about a guy who's going to come in as a one and done? Here you have Kentucky; they could have an entire team that way. I went to Syracuse, and you know w- w- Syracuse going to win the national championship until Carmelo Anthony, you know, was there as a freshman, and then he's gone. And I'm saying, you know, it's okay with me. So, what's your feeling about <laughs> it? Well, you know if. If I was coming out of high school today, I probably would have been a one and done. And education is very important to me. My mother, it was very important to my mother and my father. They wanted me to get an education. But the way that the world is right now, you know, a, a student or a, or a player, they're going to do what they feel is in, in their best interest. As coaches or as a college coach now, I want him to be here as long as he can to help not only help the program and help the school, but also help him and develop him into the person, uh, the player that, the best player that he could be. But at some point, that that player, that person is going to do whatever is in his or her best interest. Now, uh, you said I'm, I can be as good a salesman as any, and of course, John Thompson was a great salesman to you <laughs> to get him to Georgetown. You going to take a page from him a little bit? Um, I know it's it's not that difficult a school to sell. Tell me. It's not a difficult school to, to sell. Uh, Georgetown is a, a global university. When you talk about Georgetown, it's a, it's a university that's known uh, not only here in America, but all over the world. And, you know, when you talk about Georgetown basketball, it's the same. It's, it's known. We've just had a, a few lean years, and it's my goal and my job to try to, you know, to build it back up. You know, we're out on the recruiting trail trying to uh, get the best players that we possibly can. Hopefully, uh, you know, some of them will de- decide to, to come back and, and help to get us back to uh, prominence. Uh, but only time will tell. You've got some pretty good talent. I know you've already, uh, you know, have one outstanding signee, but you've got great talent in the D.C., Virginia, Baltimore area. That's, it's been kind of a hotbed in many respects in basketball, hasn't it? Yeah, yes, it has. D.C., Virginia, Baltimore definitely is the hotbed in basketball right now. And when we, uh, when Georgetown was was rolling, the only way that, that talent would leave D.C. is if we weren't interested in them. And that's what we need to get back to. We need to get back to where these homegrown kids stay home, and their mother and father and family can come see them play, and see them play at a high level. 
Tell me about the NBA today. Uh, tell me about your thoughts of the transformation, and it has, it's different than when you played, and it's different than what it was before you played when I first started following the, the game. Uh, your thoughts about it and where has it gone? The NBA has uh, definitely changed. It's a lot different than when I played. When I played, it was too big. You know, you have two in, three out. Now it's uh, sometimes five on the perimeter. Sometimes it's, you know, one in, four out. Uh, you know, scoring is, is at an all-time high. Uh, there's more threes being shot now than, than any time in history. You know, the, the ball is a, a more of a movement game. They want to be ball movement, player movement. Uh, it's definitely changed. The bigs are not as dominant as it was when I played. The younger bigs now are, are they're you know a lot more dominant or they're going to be dominant, but it's definitely a totally different game and I think you know in some respects it's good and you know some respects is is not in terms you know the bigs they're like I was saying there's not that many dominant bigs I think there are bigs who who are who can be dominant but sometimes they get tunnel vision on just shooting threes instead of working on uh, all aspects of their game. But I think the NBA game is great. I enjoyed uh, coaching in it for the, the amount of years that I've that coached in it. I worked with some great talent. And now that I, I'm here in college, it's my goal to get some guys in this university that can uh, not only help us to win, but also help them to get to the, their dream, which is to make it to the NBA. So today, if, young, if kids are watching the NBA and they see, you know, Steph Curry and they see the way the Golden State Warriors are playing – you know, obviously, that uh, the style of play that is being, you know, played by winning teams in the NBA is going to be what they want to do. You will adapt to it, I guess, right? Oh, definitely. I mean, but the only difference is there's only one Steph Curry. <laughs> Everybody <laughs> wants to be able to play like that. But a lot of the shots that Steph takes, if someone else took, uh, took him, you'd be like, get him out. That's a terrible shot. But he right. has the ability the uncanny ability to make those shots. Uh, so, you know, you, you live with, with the shots that he's, he, he takes. But the NBA has definitely uh, changed, and everybody wants to be able to do the things that like Golden State does, uh, which is, you know, at times five out. Um, they have some great talent on that team. Uh, they play very well together, and the, the best thing that they do is not only they score, but they also defend. Uh, you know, people give, don't give them credit for you know for defending, and they're one of the the best defensive teams in the league. Also, to go along with all that potent offense that they have. You know, you look at uh, you know teams that may resemble more of a throwback, and maybe not the San Antonio Spurs. Are you are you kind of amazed at what? They've achieved uh, for such a long time. You know, you have to take your head, your hat off to Pop. He's done an outstanding job. He's a great coach, uh, a great uh, person. I had the opportunity to play against him, to coach against him. Uh, and I think he's done an outstanding job of always re- being able to retool his team. You know, first it was David. David started to get older. They got Tim Duncan. Then they got uh, Parker, Ginobili. Now they got have Kawhi Leonard. They they've been blessed to be able to do it the way that they see fit and was be able to retool their team right you know before it got got too old that they can't be as effective. You know David Robinson, of course, who Patrick uh, you know you referred to uh, came from Navy, but a lot of the other players were drawn from the international pool. That's not a bad pool when you and it just dawned on me you talk about the global. Georgetown uh, imprimatur here, um, that's not a bad place, perhaps, to oh, test the waters, no? Oh, definitely. I mean, basketball is a global game now. People coming from all over uh, the world to play. Uh, you have Chinese, you have you know, Italians, you have Peruvian, you have you know, Africans, you got people from all everywhere, uh, all walks of life not only in the NBA, but also have dreams to, to get into the NBA. And basketball is one of the the top uh, played sports in, in the world. So I think that it's great to be able to uh, draw from that pool. And uh, those that's one of the things I think that we need to be able to do here at Georgetown is to try to not only, you know, build from the people here in the States, but also make sure that we, we're looking at the international players also. When I got the job, Yao Ming is one of the people who I coach. He reached out to me, and I told him, I said, Yao, I know there's uh, you have a lot of Chinese that's playing basketball there. 
So if you have any that's not already uh, playing on the pro level, please think of us before you send them anywhere else. <laughs> <laughs> That'd be, that would be a good extension for, uh, you know, recruiting for you, Patrick. Uh, you know, oh, it's funny, uh, you know, I know you won a national championship, uh, you know, at Georgetown and also the victims of one of the great upsets of all time. Uh, tell me what your thoughts were after that uh, game with Villanova for the title. I still hate talking about that game. You know, to this day, uh, it still sticks in my craw. But you have to take your head off to Ed and uh, Roley and the guys. They played an outstanding game. They played, uh, I guess you would say, a perfect game, and they still were only able to beat us by, what is it, one or two? Two, 66-64. Um, yep. Right. You know, they played a, a great game to be able to, and they still was only able to, to beat us by, by that uh, slimmer margin. But you still, you can't take anything away from them. They played well. But, you know, sometimes I think we played them. That was our third or fourth time playing them. Sometimes it's hard to beat a team uh, three or four times in a, in a row. Well, Patrick, you know, I think you have the temperament, the perfect temperament to be a successful coach because I think you're sincere. And we all know, I don't think I know you're sincere, and that's the way you've been. And um, you are what you are, and it's a great uh, figure to have for people, youngsters, to you know, play for you at Georgetown. What do you think will be the toughest task you have in this in this new job? Well, uh, you know what? I'm not going to say uh, any particular thing is going to be a, a toughest task. Everybody keeps talking about the recruiting. Uh, it's different. It's something that, uh, you know, I, I haven't done. I was one of the most highly recruited players when I when came out of high school. It's not something that I've done. I, I started uh, the, re- the recruiting Walking down the recruiting uh, lane, uh, was out all last weekend uh, looking at these high school kids and, you know, trying to uh, recruit a lot of them. Uh, so it's something that I think that I, I can do. I have some, I surround myself with great uh, recruiters and guys who've been in this business for a lot of years and to uh, bring me up to speed. But I, I mean, I, I would say that probably would be the th- the only thing. I think basketball is basketball. It's something that I've been working on for a lot of years, even though it's, it's been in the NBA. But I think um, you know I'm going to be a very good coach, and I'm going to surround myself with guys who uh, for with things that uh, I'm not as good uh, with to be able to help me. Well, Patrick Ewing finally gets a well-deserved coaching post, and it uh, it's it is alma mater Georgetown. If he can bring back the Hoyas, and who's who says why not? That's going to be a big feather in his cap. Patrick, thanks for being with us on our podcast. Really appreciate it, my friend. My pleasure, and you have a, a wonderful day. Thank you, Pat. All right, bye-bye. Well, now it's time for Taking Stock, where I offer my thoughts on a topic that's out there. And how about who should be selected as the NBA's most valuable player? You know, any talk of MVP in any sport always begs the question, should the award go to the best player in the league? Should it go to the player who proved to be the most valuable to his team, which reached success? The one with the best statistics? So what are the guidelines for most valuable player? I think somehow, while there are many candidates and many parameters, somehow you kind of know. The trend in sports, particularly basketball and baseball, are very much about numbers. Statistics. Metrics, they're called now. Advanced metrics. And I think they have to play a role. Then there is the judgment as to who is the best. A lot of factors go into that for sure. So let's get to it. We all know many of the candidates. LeBron James. Is there a better all-round player? Has there been a better all-round player since Michael Jordan? And the others, James Harden, Kawhi Leonard, Russell Westbrook. Obviously, you can make a case for all of them and maybe some more. In the era of Jordan, you could just about put his name down every year. He won it five times. Kareem Abdul-Jabbar captured it the most, six times. LeBron has four MVPs and still counting. In my view, I witnessed the season and I used the eye test. Who did I see who I would declare this player is the most valuable player of the season I just viewed? To me, it's Russell Westbrook of the Thunder. Numbers-wise, what he accomplished in averaging a triple-double for the season is amazing. I know the great Oscar Robertson achieved it in the 1961-62 campaign, long before they kept records of a triple-double, which is averaging double figures in points, rebounds, and assists. 
The Big O averaged over 10 points, 10 rebounds, and 10 assists for the season. So did Westbrook. And Westbrook did it without Kevin Durant, who probably overshadowed him when he was in Oklahoma City. But it shows a phenomenal consistency over 82 games. With all the travel, back-to-back games involved, it shows a remarkable show of energy and joy of playing. Funny, in today's increased move, as you know, to resting star players to keep them fresh, Russell Westbrook looked fresh and ready every game. I'm not saying he's a better player than LeBron James or a better defender and all-round force than Kawhi Leonard. I'm just saying Russell Westbrook is the NBA's most valuable player this season, in my opinion. Well, once again, my thanks to Patrick Ewing for talking with us on this episode of Stockton. And a reminder to email me at info at StocktonPodcast.com and subscribe to Stockton on iTunes to get the very latest episode as soon as it's posted. Thanks also to my producer, Peter Lyon, and my all-round audio guru, Greg Session, for their help with Stockton. Stockton is produced by Collisions, the podcast division of CRN International. Collisions, podcasts for curious people. I'm Dick Stockton. So long, everyone.